The, the challenge that's faced uh, by the technician uh, music audiophile who is uh, trying to uh, extract the best performance from a, a, a stereo pair of loudspeakers in a, in a room has to do with um, uh, reflections that come off uh, the walls. And over the years, many different setups have been proposed some relying on uh, mathematical ratios, golden means, and things like that. All of them have uh, certain uh, limitations. Uh, one limitation with the, uh, with the ratio approach is that it assumes that the setup will be in a, a essentially rectangular room. But if the room is L-shaped, or if one of the walls uh, is largely glass, then it starts to become less uh, efficacious. The history of the Wilson Audio Setup Procedure goes back quite a few years. And it was uh, not developed as a result of mathematical formulas or anything like that. It was simply a matter of um, observing circumstances over a period of quite some time and through many setups. I began to realize that uh, the distance to the side wall and the wall behind the speaker uh, was very critical. It wasn't just a matter of estimating it. Uh, it uh, the Areas where there was interaction, which we came to call the zone of interaction, was rather sharply delineated in most rooms with the area of neutrality, where you seem to have a greater sense of freedom from the sonic artifacts created by reflections from the, 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 the nearest wall. So this, uh, for me, this really started to all gel together as, as a, um, not only a, a, a concept, but a series of procedures, and then a protocol which set forth the limits of the procedure so that you knew exactly how to do it. And so this narrow zone of neutrality um, became wonderfully, um, it, 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 it was wonderful because you could detect where it was. And there were um, repeatable tools that you could use, namely your voice and your ears. If you have the loudspeaker very close to that boundary, literally pressed up against the boundary. A thing that is very noticeable is the uh, base reinforcement. As you move away from the boundary very quickly, uh, you lose that base support. And as you're using your voice as the signal source, you'll find that as the back of your head gets maybe seven to 10 inches away from the wall, you're no longer hearing any low frequency reinforcement in the sound from your voice. But what you may perceive, and you can train yourself to be perceptive to this type of thing, is that that sound now is radiating along that wall, that boundary, and at some point in time, it hits a change. And you don't hear it as a, an echo like you would in a canyon or something like that. But you hear it instead as a, um, a sense of artificial largeness to the sound. So as you slowly progress away from that boundary, you'll notice that your voice becomes more localized. You're not hearing a sense that you are bigger than you are. Uh, you're, you're hearing your voice more just as your voice, parenthetically, the way it would sound outdoors, away from walls.
that's the basic fundamental first step in doing this and that's to find where the low frequency break is and where slightly after that where your voice starts to sound more like it would sound outdoors and it'll as you continue to move away from that wall maybe only for six inches maybe a foot it's usually no more than a foot and a half if you have a foot and a half zone of neutrality you've got a good room um, during within that zone your voice sound quality changes surprisingly little but as soon as you get to the outer edge of that you re-enter a zone of interaction and your voice changes pretty dramatically after that so we always you know uh, uh, urge our people to mark those the the boundaries there so that you know you have that zone of neutrality between it and then you can do the sidewall and and of course as you do the sidewall you have a zone of neutrality the beauty of this is that once you place that speaker in that zone of neutrality and we're not saying it's perfect at that point but you have overcome 90 percent of the gremlins in that room if you were to do nothing else but that it would be a better than average setup compared to most speaker setups that are out there so in this project of liberation of the speaker uh, from the tyranny of the reflection of the rooms um, we have found uh, some zones of neutrality uh, where you put the speakers as a start position because if you're not in that start start position I guarantee you that if you are perceptive and if you have correct assumptions and standards about the sound it will take you a long frustrating time to get the speakers acceptable but if you start from those two positions it's simply now a matter of going step by step in a procedure that will inexorably bring you better and better sound until the sound is about as good as the room and the associated speaker and the program sources will will allow find out from your customer about their listening desires and then um, after the speakers are uncrated since you know the general distance and the general ear height and do measure it um, go ahead and create the internal final architectural uh, construction of that customer speaker system and so what do we know about the character of, of this interaction? It's pretty predictable, really. We already talked about being close to the boundary and having base reinforcement, but we can be more specific now than that. Since we are in zones of neutrality, what you do at that point is you, um, what we call zone the system. So you actually measure, I use a tape measure, our team uses a tape measure, and you measure the distance from the, uh, the uh, wall behind. Now, you have gridded these speakers so that as a start point, a start point, you have the speakers placed approximately two-thirds of the way forward within the square. We've generally found that is a, a more productive start point than say starting directly in the middle and you pick a corner of the speaker that you have easy access to sometimes that's on the inside corner of the speaker near the front sometimes it's not sometimes it's one of the other corners but you have to pick um, the same corner on the two speakers and you have the graduations that go back 
in um, centimeters or inches. And uh, you start with them the same distance from the wall behind the, the, the speakers. One of the beauties of this particular uh, fact of physics, reflections affecting sound in predictable ways, is that you can identify the sonic clues that are very specific to those sonic maladies, those reflective artifacts that rob us of the authenticity of the, of the reproduction of sound that, that we're hearing. And so there's basically just a handful of, of categories. There's low frequency energy and extension. There's upper bass articulation and clarity. In the realm of sound staging performance from your system, there is center focus, the ability to focus so that that clarinet sounds like one clarinet that's playing rather than two, and where did the second one come from? And then a satisfying sense of ambient space if the ambient space is genuinely in the recording. Uh, there's also uh, the harmonic balance. Some people will call that orchestral balance, but it is the balance of the fundamentals and then their harmonic series. Sense of dynamics. Sense of dynamics is not just, oh, it's real quiet between the notes. It's how quickly can you go from relative silence to fortissimo fortissimo. Um, it's how cleanly it will do it. Um, it's over what frequency range it can do it. Uh, and there's also what we call flow. And f that is a completely non-technical term but it has to do with the, um, the rate of decay of, uh, of, of sound after each chord flowing into the next. So in this process of diagnosing uh, the, the, the sound quality, now we have We've set forth the criteria that we use, and um, we've, we've set forth a measurement stick, which is the gridding of the room. And so uh, you would listen to your uh, sample piece of music, hopefully some music that will demonstrate convincingly each of those uh, criteria and then grade them. So how do you grade them? The grading system that we recommend is from one to five, one being horrible, five being fabulous, almost beyond belief. And um, what I've always done is uh, like a two would be similar to a D in academic grading. Then what if it's a little better than a D, but it isn't quite a C. Well, it would be a two plus. Uh, and one step above that would be a three minus. And so this gives you more increments so that you can, you can uh, grade in a more uh, incrementally precise way. Because sometimes you'll hear only subtle differences when you make a change. But you need to know, is it subtly better or subtly worse in that particular area? If the bass is too heavy, then that clue in and of itself would suggest move them slightly forward. So for us, slightly forward would be, say, a one-inch increment. 
What if the speaker is too far forward? Well, what happens then is the bass will usually uh, be lighter, it will be uh, snappier, um, but there won't be enough low bass. And so the clue there is the balance between the two. Is there a tonal balance, a believable tonal balance of bass weight and clarity? It's too close to the wall behind it, lack of clarity, too much bass. Too far away, clarity but not enough deep bass. Those are a couple of clues as to which direction you begin moving the speaker. There's also soundstage parameters. So, soundstage. The importance of using um, a program material that has some genuine uh, center of soundstage information. Uh, I happen to use uh, Flim and the BB's new pants. There are percussion instruments and everything that should be sharply focused. The attack of the, of the percussion should be sharply focused in the center uh, of the sound stage. Um, generally speaking, as the, if the speakers are moved closer to the wall behind them, the sound stage will collapse a little bit and you'll get a denser center focus. Not as sharp necessarily, but it'll be really dense. As you move the speakers further from the wall behind them, then the sound stage becomes more and more expansive. So if your speakers are too far forward, you'll get this big sense of, of, of stage, but you want to make sure that you don't get a lot of the sense of phasiness off to the sides. Uh, if, if you're getting that, then chances are you're too far forward. So, we've looked at four little sonic parameters at this point, which can then give you two clues as to the direction that you want to move the speakers. If you're hearing a sound which is lean in the bass and a little bit phasey off to the sides and the center focus is not real sharp, it's pretty loud and clear. You've got to move it back a little bit. By a little bit, I mean an inch. And you have to keep records of this. Because we're really working with the distance between the baffle uh, and an adjacent wall, we're not really looking for perfectly flat frequency response as a result of this um, voicing of the speaker relative to the boundaries. We're looking for an improvement of the um, evenness of the, uh, of the musical uh, scale. It may seem odd that uh, adjustments of just uh, a, an inch or less can make a, a, even an audible difference at all, and yet sometimes the, the improvement that is wrought is not only audible, but uh, remarkably important from a musical standpoint. And what you're also going to find is that when you make changes, some areas uh, are likely to get better but other areas are likely to get worse until you start getting to that sweet spot when everything starts to really come together and it's fun to listen to.